Welcome to the seventh episode of the Creative Wanderer podcast, your weekly jaunt into creative inspiration. We are Joe and Emilia. Hello, Emilia. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in this week. Today, we'll be talking about week six of The Artist Way, recovering a sense of abundance. We will be looking at our ideas around God around money and creative abundance. We'll talk about luxury and how the smallest kindness to oneself can be a luxurious thing. Oh, yay. Nice bit of luxury. Absolutely. So hopefully you're enjoying the Artist's Way journey with us. And if you are and you'd like an extra member of your sacred circle, Amelia and I are very happy to be able to offer you our support in a number of ways. You can email us to let us know what you're enjoying or indeed what you're struggling with at creative underscore wanderer at yahoo.com. Please follow us on Instagram at creative wanderer. All you need to do is replace part of creative with the number eight and the beginning of wanderer with the number one. Please share any pictures, quotes you've been inspired by or affirmations which which resonate with you. So the question, which is the same question we have every week, how did you find this week of abundance, Amelia? It was an eye-opener for me in terms of understanding how my relationship with money impacts my creativity and how much I feel I'm able to create. I loved discovering that luxury does not necessarily have to be expensive and how it is all about attention to detail and those small things in life which make us happy and make us feel worthy. And the biggest aha moment for me was while I was walking in nature and I realized just how prolific and abundant Mother Nature is and that I can always turn to her for creative ideas and inspiration when my own creative well dries up. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Yes. It made me really look at what I spend money on, Mm. you know, and being really grateful for all of the money that comes to me Mm. in my life and knowing that when I buy something that's specifically for me, how much gratitude I give that particular thing. And thanks for the money that has allowed me to buy it. And I found uncovering my relationship with the word God and the connotations that I've attached to that very interesting and freeing. Because I feel an affinity with the terms universe, source, my higher self, the word God. I've really struggled with it. Yes, there is lots to unpack when it comes to the concept of God. Mm, For sure. Absolutely. Should we dive straight in? Let's dive straight in. What a big week. Of course, we cannot talk about abundance without mentioning the big M word, money. But when it comes to this particular chapter, we have to talk about it because we have to understand that money is abundant. Well, we live in a physical universe. We need to buy physical things, right, in order to survive. And money is intricately connected to those physical things. Without the money, technically, we can't buy and we can't get them. Or perhaps we could. Who Mm. knows? Let's really unpack this idea of money and God abundance and see how it all plays together Mm. in a way. Definitely, let's do it. Money is a creative block, I would say. A huge one, isn't it? It really is. I think because we've got a number of toxic ideas about money that we've inherited from our family and society, education and all of that gubbins. And in week six, Julia drives home some pretty hard truths about how we relate to money, which are not easy to take and they're definitely not popular. Mm. It all boils down to us and a simple fact. What are we doing to take responsibility for the condition of lack that we have created ourselves and which we then use as an excuse for not creating? It's a bit of a catch-22. I guess that's why this Mm. chapter this week is a bit of a... Well, for me, you might laugh, was a bit of a slap in the face, (laughs) right? Our creative blocks, no matter what they are, in this case, we are talking about money. It all always circles back to us, doesn't it? Our Mm. own responsibility and how we technically are creating our own creative blocks. And we are using them to justify not taking responsibility where needed. It's a tough road to travel. It is, and it's a bit of a strange one because we are creating lack. And I understand the dichotomy of those Mm. words being used together but the creation of lack is what we're doing yes we are creating lack and then we're using our own creation of lack as an excuse for not being able to create oh i don't have enough money for that you know and we all know what the next thing is that's connected to money is time of course no money no time yeah definitely so this week we might experience a roller coaster of emotions and rapid changes of emotional states when working through the chapter Because this week is the week where in our morning pages we have to write down our understanding of God. Right. Doing that every morning was crunchy for me. Mm. 
it really was. What was an eye-opener for me was this relationship between the way I view God, mm -hmm. the life force, the great creator, the universe, whichever name we want to give it. it. <laughs> And then how it all connects and ties into my sense of abundance. Yeah. Who do I rely on when it comes to abundance? Because it's not the money that I should be relying on or how much money I've got in my bank account. It's so much more. It's more of a feeling of expansion and abundance. And the feeling within me of how much abundance I feel I can have. It's almost like my havingness level. My ability to have, is it high or is it low? You know, most of the time we actually buy things to have them. However, the underlying underpinning condition is this feeling of abundance within you, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because sure. if you feel poor... Then all you get is more poor. Exactly. There's a lovely paragraph where Julia talks about examining our uh, relationship to God in our morning pages. Yeah. And this is what Julia says. This week in your morning pages, write about the God you do believe in and the God you would like to believe in. For some of us, this means, what if God's a woman and she's on my side? For others, it is a God of energy. For still others, a collective of higher forces moving us toward our highest good. And if you're still dealing with a God consciousness that has remained unexamined since childhood, you're probably dealing with a toxic God. What would a non-toxic God think of your creative goals? Might such a God really exist? If so, would money or your job or your lover remain your higher power? It really does get us to think about this relationship we have to God, the life force, and how we shift that concept into people. Mm. And we place the expectations that perhaps the life force can give us. We actually place them and embed them in people. Yeah. And most of the time, those people cannot meet our needs. Yeah. And they don't necessarily know that those needs have been placed upon them. Exactly. And then you get that clash of expectations. Yeah. And it's wonderful to be able to unburden that person of those expectations by placing the right expectation into the right concept. Yeah. So we wanted to really, really look at the definition of God. Mm. God can be quite a contentious concept. Yeah, it's loaded sure. with meaning for so many people. It's loaded with emotion, experiences. So we break down the definition of God. We do. Let's see what it means. It has a quite a few definitions. Yes. One of them is a being conceived as the perfect, omnipotent, omniscient originator and ruler of the universe, the principal object of faith and worship in monotheistic religions. Another one is the force, effect or a manifestation or aspect of this being. The third one is a being of supernatural powers or attributes believed in and worshipped by a people, especially a male deity thought to control some part of nature or reality. Number four, an image of a supernatural being, an idol. And finally, one that is worshipped, idolized or followed. Now, when we look at the derivation of the word God, we take it back all the way to Sanskrit, to a word which means to call, to invoke. Wow. Yeah. And even further, we can take it to, to pour in the context of pour a libation. That's mm. amazing, isn't it? It's really fascinating to me that originally in Germanic, the word was a neutral noun. Right. And only actually after the coming of Christianity was the gender shifted into masculine. Well, Julia speaks to the fact that very often we assign this patriarchal image to God. We refer to God as he and within there lies the trap mm. because we look at a God as the father figure and then we make that God human mm -hmm. and liken that God to our fathers or grandfathers or brothers. And we perhaps project the same expectations on God and on our male companions mm -hmm. whereas I think it's very important to step away from that for sure and really look at it as something that's more of a neutral life force something that actually has the potentiality of being the masculine the feminine the it 
Everything. Everything, mm-hmm. exactly. Because the struggle that I have is that God is a being, as a solid being. I find that completely right. alien concept, you know, because really it is the collective higher consciousness of all of us. Because we are all one, we are all of source, we are mm. all spirit, then what we do as a collective has an impact on the rest of the collective. So surely that then would be God. I'm a bit of a Star Wars fan. Oh gosh, me too. Feel the force, Luke. Isn't it? Mm. It's the force. It's the force. I've not thought about the force for a while, actually. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Another thing that I really struggle with as well is the notion that God, or whatever you want to call it, wants us to struggle. Mm. You know, that's really based on learned falsehoods. Yes, it is. There's a lovely quote from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, where Sirius Black says to Harry, you've all got both light and dark inside us. What matters is the part we choose to act on. That is who we really are. Mm. Throughout my life, I've learned to embrace the darkness. Perhaps when I was a bit younger, I used to fear it. But now I realise that it's an important part of existence and that we cannot qualify it as good or bad. It just is. Mm -hmm. It is what we do with it and how we relate to it that actually gives us significance and weight in our lives. Yeah. So I guess the point that Julia is making in this section is let's befriend this God. Let's make this life force that is so supportive of creativity and creation. Let's make it our friend. Mm. Let's step into trusting it the same way we trust our bank account when it's nice and plump and full and we feel all cozy and safe. (laughs) We can sleep at night. Yeah, that's true. Julia references this quote from the Bible. She says, consider the lilies of the field. It comes from Matthew 6, 28. And it says, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Which means that in the most difficult moments of worry or anxiety, God faithfully reminds us to consider how Mother Nature, Life Force, provides everything they need. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I sat down and I kind of uh, contemplated this point a little bit. Yes, I mean, consider the lilies of the field. Well, that's not going to put the food on the table, is it now? Living in the physical universe requires us to turn to physical stuff in order to survive. And what this requires us to do is to see beyond the physical. Yeah. Feel the force, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And know it has your back. It will support you. Trust it. Embrace it. Befriend it. And do not be suspicious or sceptical of it. Just because you can't physically touch it or see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, that's true. Mm. I think that really goes into looking at our limiting and negative beliefs about money, doesn't it? Yes. Money's bad. Money's the root of all evil. Time is money. Money makes the world go around. Money talks. We're literally bombarded with all of these slogans, aren't we? Sayings. And we subconsciously adopt them. Yeah, we do. You know, you've got to work hard to earn some good money. Money doesn't grow on trees. Right. Well, (laughs) it's an interesting place to stop and think about your own limiting beliefs that you have about money. Dig them out really inspect them, find out where they came from. A lot of my limiting beliefs come from my mum. Oh, for example. For sure. And then, you know, you weigh them up. You say, are they true? Whose are they? Are they mine? And how can I rephrase them, reframe them into positive affirmations? Yeah. That, again, is tied into the concept of scarcity and lack that is so embedded in the concept of money. For sure. There isn't enough to go around and we're constantly chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. Yeah. There are a couple of wonderful uh, quotes in this week's chapter. There are indeed. One of them says, money is God in action. Yeah, that's by Raymond Charles Barker. Mm -hmm. That's lovely, isn't it? And another one is... All substance is energy in motion. It lives and flows. Money is symbolically a golden flowing stream of concretized vital energy. And that's from the magical work of the soul. Mm. Why don't we use our imagination to actually imagine incredible amounts of this beautiful golden flow around us coming in and out and weaving through our lives? Yeah. Doesn't cost us anything, Just does imagine it? it into being. Exactly. It does reframe our expectations in terms of what we are expecting the money or the abundance flow to bring us. Yes. 
what's it going to bring? We found Maslow's Pyramid on our wanderings this week, didn't we, Joe? We did, and we went for a walk up that pyramid. Right. <laughs> so what is Maslow's Pyramid? Well, it's a theory by Abraham Maslow. It's of the hierarchy of needs, which puts forward that people are motivated by five basic categories of needs. Physiological, safety, love, esteem, and finally, right at the top of that pyramid, self-actualization. Yes, which means achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. The system in which we live wants to keep us at the bottom, around the so one and two, doesn't it? The basic right. needs, physiological, water, food, warmth and rest. And then security and safety. Yes, that's true. Money pretty much is at the bottom. Yeah. Because in order to get food, water, warmth, rest, we need money in this world, right? Yeah. So it's very easy if we are blocked in terms of money to just stay at the bottom. Yeah. And never move up. Now, the trick is to actually live your life top down. Yeah, definitely. Because it's like living your dharma, isn't it? Living mm. your truth, living your life purpose is the top. And by doing that, you get all of the stuff down to the bottom. Yes, exactly. If you want to find out more about Maslow's Pyramid, you can do so on our blog page on Medium. The other limiting belief that we have regards serious work and creative work we're being told that work must be hard and involve long hours of toil and suffering and, and sweat art, and sweat and art is frivolous and you know it's just something you do on the side but because it's classed as fun it comes second oh you mean you it's know? not real work it's not real work of course all, it is all the painting that you do is just faffing about isn't <laughs> it? But the truth is that creativity is playful by nature and mm. what we're meant to do comes to us easily. And it doesn't feel like work anyway, does it? Because we're enjoying it. And then we have that on the dark side of that. We feel like we're cheating if money comes easily to us because if we're doing something that we love and then we're getting paid for it. We're like, oh, yes, it's that indoctrination that we actually start getting, I guess, from the kindergarten, you know, work hard, you've got to study hard for your grades, then you've got to work hard to get a good job. And you've got to really, really work hard to save a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So we then equate serious hard work with accomplishment, with money, with something that's worthy. Even though it's coming easily, it doesn't mean that you're not working hard at it. Yeah. You know, it's that thought process that if you're not on your knees by the end of the day, you don't deserve to be paid for it. But even if you're doing something you love, you still put your time and effort into it. The bonus is it's blooming wonderful. It should flow and it should feel like play. Absolutely. The other realisation that really was big for me, and it's simple, but sometimes in life we need to stop and re-examine our beliefs in order for the penny to drop, to have yeah. that penny drop up, is that it's us humans who place limitations on life and things. Yeah. The big kicker for me, the real truth, was what we want and what the creator wants are the same thing. Of course. Because we are it, it is us. Creativity is all about expansion. The life force is all about expansion. expansion. Yeah. We are uh, simpatico mm. in harmony. Totally. It's simpatico. What a lovely word. I know. There is one expression that Julia mentions and she calls this playful creativity that we engage in as artists and creatives as sheer creative glee. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I love the word glee. Me too. It's it such a wonderful great word. great delight. Oh, yeah. yes. And it is demonstrated in Mother Nature. Yeah, and Julia's pearl of wisdom that really is gorgeous this week is creativity is not and never has been sensible. Why should it be? Do you still think there's some moral virtue in being martyred? If you want to make some art, make some art. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, exactly. Julian! It's yeah. lovely. So it's all about learning how to put ourselves in a state of feeling creative and abundant in the now. Yes. And this is your favourite. And yep. this is what I've learned from Joe. It's important to give ourselves small treats and breaks. It is. And talking of small treats, Amelia, mm. this launches us rather beautifully into luxury. Yes. 
What is important to take away is the understanding that our limiting beliefs about money also shape our ideas about creativity. Yeah, so if we feel miserly about money, we'll feel miserly about our creativity. I guess that's the hard punch in the face, isn't it? It is. (laughs) We yearn to be creative, but we don't give ourselves the permission to invest the time and the space creativity requires. We neglect ourselves and then we get more and more focused on the lack. That's so true. That's a trap. The lack trap. Absolutely. We've got to pamper ourselves. Definitely. Julia says, art is born in expansion, in a belief in sufficient supply. It is critical that we pamper ourselves for the sense of abundance it brings us. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. And luxury doesn't have to mean that you go out there and spend all your savings on the most expensive item or whatever makes you happy. Luxury is creative. And we find luxury in the smallest things that keep on giving and help us enjoy life. It's like when you are in a supermarket and you walk past strawberries and they smell incredible you know the smell of an English strawberry there's Mm. nothing quite like it oh my goodness I simply must buy them you want to get your teeth into them the juiciness of them and that's luxury yes and treating yourself to those strawberries even if they are perhaps a couple of pounds more expensive than what you'd usually Mm. pay yeah you know and this is i think our trap we pay our bills and we pay hundreds of pounds towards something that we do not value but then we are so frugal with ourselves yeah when it comes to those small items that we actually do value but we feel like we need to penny pinch right you know that would be nice but i'd rather not yeah but then when you actually do buy them and you have them and then you realize wow such a treat yeah That feeling of expansion that they create within you, that's priceless. You can't buy that. And it's those feelings that we need to cultivate and focus on. Yeah. Remembering that lack of money is never an authentic block. The feeling of constriction and powerlessness, that is the actual block. Yes, that's the underlying emotion and then the money just overlays it. Because you feel powerless because Mm -hmm. we're caught in the money trap. How am I going to make more money? I'm doing a nine to five job. And how do I create more time in which to create more money? That's the block, the powerlessness of it all. It is. We feel like we do not have choice. Mm -hmm. We do not have options. And Julia has a fantastic pearl of wisdom. She says, art requires us to empower ourselves with choice. At the most basic level, this means choosing to do self-care. Yeah. And with this small act of pampering that do not have to be expensive, we are actually doing exactly that. We are doing self-care. Yeah, because what you don't want to have is that artistic anorexia mm. that occurs when we deny ourselves luxury. And actually luxury is a state of great comfort or elegance, especially when involving great expense. It is something that is not essential, but provides pleasure and comfort. And it comes from a Latin word, which means excess. I love the Latin word, luxuria. Ah, yes. It's nice, isn't it? Luxuria. Could call your pet, luxuria. (laughs) So there is also another uh, concept to look at, and it's luxury versus privileges. Mm. Mm. Yeah. If you are a wealthy individual, you can buy, quote unquote, a lot of privileges in life. Yeah. First class tickets to this, that top hotels, top food. So it's not a luxury to them. That's true. It's good to be able to distinguish between luxury and those privileges because if you are constantly used to these privileges, luxury kind of loses its luster. And the trick is to find luxury in everyday life, even in the smallest items that perhaps do not scream luxury, but to you, they are luxurious. For me, Finding really good quality tea. (laughs) That's the strawberries to me. Yeah. It might be slightly more expensive, but when I sit down without a cup of tea on a rainy afternoon with a book, I feel like the richest woman on the planet. That's great. It's just a cup of tea. 
But that tea is not just a cup of tea because it's been picked by somebody and it's been packaged by somebody. So there's a long story behind it. I was just going to say that what I took away from the luxury section this week was that I started approaching luxury as something that when I pamper myself, it actually opens up a whole world of possibilities or stories, you know, Mm. a nice piece of really good artisan chocolate. Yes. Or for me, I really love a really good slice of bread. Oh, yes. With butter on it. Fresh bread, butter, jam. Perfect. It doesn't cost you hundreds of pounds, does it? I guess luxury's also got to do with the quality of the item. And what went into creating it. So the love actually is part of the Mm. what went into it. Another way of finding luxury in our life is giving time to our passions. Yeah. So many things compete for our time. Stop. Remember your favorite pastimes. Fill up your life with your favorite pastimes. Those are also your small little luxuries that you can gift to yourself. And also, there is a lovely little trap that we fall into when we do give ourselves a little bit of luxury and spend half a day doing what we love and we hear that voice, oh, I should really be working. Yeah. Well, rephrase it into, well, I should be playing. Definitely. Playing's vital. Encouraging creative pleasure is a healthy habit. Of course it is. Yeah. And our availability to the universal flow is what helps us thrive as artists as well as people. Exactly. And what it can bring you are little gifts into your life. I think it's important to look for the small gifts in life. So my small gift in my life It's my beautiful cat, Ziggy. Joe has the most beautiful cat. He came into our life completely by surprise, Mm. by accident. We didn't plan to have him. He is the epitome of the playful flow we spoke about. He really is. He's also the epitome of wanting my attention and competing for my time. (laughs) I guess we're bringing Ziggy up to talk about the fact that pets are also little luxuries and can totally. bring us totally bring us so much joy. joy and so much joy he makes me smile all day every day that little cat mm. he's so funny amelia knows him he is full of love and joy and constantly wants to give you kisses and absolutely adores being petted yeah he's hilarious but the joy that a pet can bring is definitely a luxury i completely absolutely. agree with you So we also examine what the actual lack of luxury does to us as creatives when we do not pamper ourselves. You withdraw though, you have nothing to fill up your well with. Because luxury is, for me, going on the artist date and spending time with myself. I love the fact that the artist dates support our luxury and the act of pampering and self-care. If we fail to focus on luxury in our lives as creatives... We are not filling up our wells with imagery. The final stab is we lose interest in our creativity because we feel like there is nothing else we can create. We've run out of ideas. Yeah, the drought. We got to stop sometimes and ask ourselves, are we practicing our craft just by rota automatically or are we working on enlarging our art and creative expression? Pampering ourselves actually helps us enlarge our art. For me, buying some new paints or learning a new technique, that's a way of enlarging and expanding my creative art. Nice. It's important to cultivate curiosity. Yes. This constant fascination and exploration is key to living a luxurious life. And embracing luxury brings about a shift in consciousness, which may trigger an increased flow. Something that Amelia and I do a lot is revel and luxuriate in the silliness of life (laughs) enjoying silliness is just wonderful it's often used as a derogatory term oh she's so silly he's so silly that's silly why would you do that no 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 silliness is playful it's joyful it's finding something gleeful in the everyday we might find that perhaps certain things that we enjoy might be a bit silly it's good and silly is often used as a defense mechanism word go and just a silly idea exactly This whole idea of creative luxury and being able to have luxury is connected to our own ideas and beliefs about our own self-worth. Do we think we are worthy of having luxury? Do we think we are worthy of pampering? So now it's time for us to slow down and take a wandering pause to reflect. Amelia, 
Do you have your bell? I do have my bell. Ring it. And breathe. It's always nice to ring that bell. We take time to reflect on our own relationship to money and luxury. Are you threatened by the idea of spoiling yourself? Are you reluctant to spend a few extra coins on a small luxury that you know you would really enjoy? How much do you think you're worth? Think about what small or big luxuries fill up your well. How can you make your home or surroundings feel more luxurious? That's a good one. It is. Actually, I bought some new bedding. And I bought some new soft furnishings for the living room. Cushions always make a big difference. Always. The joy of it. (laughs) This brings us quite nicely into the counting exercise that we had, because what it does is it asks you to have a little notebook and every purchase you make to make a note of what it was and how Mm. much you spent. Mm. And that's a great task, actually, because if you do that for a week, you then realise, well, you actually realise how much rubbish you spend money on. Exactly. But I think it's quite nice as well to add to that a little note. How did that purchase make you feel? Mm -hmm. So my cushions and my bedding and all the soft furnishings made me feel like I'd added a new lease of life to our home. I love the fact that this exercise highlights what we value and what we actually do not value, but we still spend a lot of money on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is good to write down our spending habits Mm -hmm. and have a good look at them. Definitely. I love the money madness exercise because Julia always gives us the opportunity to dig up our limiting beliefs or uh, core negative beliefs or even positive beliefs and examine them. And that was digging up a lot of very guarded beliefs that perhaps I wasn't as willing to give up as I first thought I would be. Right. I found quite a lot of ancestral family type of money uh, sayings, quotes, beliefs (laughs) that I just had to reframe and put my own spin on them. But the reluctance surprised me why I was hanging on to them so firmly, like for dear life. I was like, Amelia, let them go. (laughs) They're blocking you. To a certain degree, I also felt I was betraying my family values. Ooh. <laughs> oh, God. Limiting beliefs are very twisted sometimes. They're really, and they're really rooted. They're really deep. Yep. One of the imagination exercises I sometimes do, and that's my own, of my own invention. Millie's imagination exercises. I sometimes like to imagine the world where there isn't any money. Oh, yes. And very often I realise that money is an illusion when you look at it that way. Mm, Without a doubt. Let's face it, we are the only species that has to pay to live on this planet. And the question is, why? Actually, talking of money, I wrote a poem called The Money Zoo. Oh, did you? I did. Shall I read it? Actually, I don't know where I've got it. I'd forgotten I'd written that. Ah, here we go. The Money Zoo. Some folk had never seen it. They thought it very rare, and so at the money zoo, they could only stand and stare. Now everything's electronic. Did actual money once exist, or was it only made up? An ancient memory, now dismissed. In the £50 enclosure, the rarest note by far, someone said, ridiculously, My gran used to keep one in a jar. Oh, how they scoffed and mocked her. Don't be silly, her brother gave a look. But Franny knew it to be true. She'd read it in her granny's diary book. On and on they wandered, marvelling at what they saw. Pound coins and even an ancient halfpenny rattling across the floor. The fivers danced and tenors capered, but the twenties stayed quite still. Perhaps not quite believing they were rescued from a window sill. The keepers, they were vigilant. A breakout, they could not take the risks. Real money, out in the community, all those shiny metal discs. Far better if we only saw it behind the bars of a cage. Just use your cards and buy online. That's how it works this day and age. The kids were just so fascinated. How had this come to be? Why was money invented if we couldn't touch it? You and me, you'd think that at the money zoo, they'd make the entry free. But sorry, no, that's not the case. That'll be £7.50. and p. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it, Joe. Thank you. Money is an illusion. 100% in my opinion. <laughs> this whole task section this week gave me a sense of forward motion. Yeah. And a sense of 
needing to step outside into the real life in order to connect with the abundance outside my dwelling, outside my home. And I found so much abundance, so much free abundance, so many freebies out in London. London's just screaming at you, saying, look at me, take everything I've got as artistic inspiration. Yeah. Speaking of which... I can't believe it, Amelia. We've been on this wandering for so long, we didn't even realise right ahead of us was the inspiration station. Toot toot! Woo! (laughs) We do like our inspiration station, don't we? We certainly do. (laughs) So what has inspired you this week, Jo? This week, Amelia, Mm. I popped into my deck of Archangel Oracle cards by Doreen Virtue. Right. And I knew just the card I wanted to find. It's Prosperity. Mm. And it says this. Your material needs are provided as you follow your intuition and manifest your dreams into reality. Archangel Ariel says, I am pouring a cornucopia of prosperity upon you and your life and ask that you open your arms to receive. Some treasures will come in the form of brilliant ideas and some will come as opportunities. We'll work together to realise your highest dreams and I ask that you give any worries to me. I love this because it touches upon our spirituality. Yeah. Archangels are, in my opinion, my personal belief, life forces. Yeah. An expression of the life force, personified. Mm -hmm. So it's all about co-creation in the end, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. Mm. What have you got for us this week, Amelia? Well, I thought to give our lovely listeners some practical tools in terms of money. There is a great book on the law of attraction written by Michael Lossier and in it he lists out a number of money affirmations. Oh, I look forward to these. And hopefully our listeners and you can use them to bring in a bit more abundance and money. So this is what he says. I have an abundance of money. My bills are paid easily and quickly. I always have excess money. I always have enough money to purchase whatever I desire. Constant flow of money is coming in from multiple sources. I win prizes often, receive gifts and many free things. I am constantly increasing my amount of monetary intake from known and unknown sources. Money comes easily to me. Rent is paid easily and I always have money. Money and my relationship with it feels good. And I've got two of my own that I've collected on my travels. Money is always flowing to me easily, effortlessly and perfectly. And the one that I really love, money and I are never apart. They're lovely. They're great. Thank you for sharing those with us. You're welcome. I think I will be using them in my everyday. Oh my goodness, Amelia, we've come to the end of another episode. Already? I know, already. That was good fun. It was, wasn't it? I enjoyed talking about abundance. Me too. I'm feeling all abundant and expansive and inspired. Yay! So, Joe, what's coming up next week? Week seven of The Artist's Way, recovering a sense of connection, where we look at practicing the right attitudes for connecting to our creativity and our dreams through listening, taking risks, dealing with jealousy, and through navigating perfectionism. Ooh, a big week coming up. A very big week coming up, yeah. Thank you for wandering with us, and remember to always be on the lookout for the presence of wonder. See you next time. Thank you.